Hello everyone and welcome back. Now, in the previous few videos, we've been learning how to understand solutions to differential and difference equations. Now, what I would like to do is uh, start going a little bit deeper. And what I'd like to do in particular is demonstrate some methods of analyzing these systems using tools from mathematics that you probably already know. In particular, what we're going to look at are eigenvalue and eigenvector methods for understanding dynamics of these systems near those steady states or equilibria that are so important to our systems. Now, in this lecture, I want to start simple and I want to look at linear systems of differential equations. So what is it that I mean by that? Well, similar to how we set up uh, those linear programming problems, I'm going to have the change in the first variable is going to be a number times the first variable plus a number times the second variable all the way up to a number times the last variable. And you're going to get this same basic process for every single one of these variables so that you get something that looks like this. 2x2 plus dot 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 a n n x n. Okay, so the linearity here comes from the fact that there, the only exponent on every single one of your variables is 1. Okay, there is no explicit time dependence on the right hand side here. All there are are constants a, uh, a sub 1, 1, a 1, 2, all the way up, you know, for every single combination from 1 to n in the first index and 1 to n in the second index. Now, you can actually write this much more compactly using vector notation. So you could instead just say this is the derivative of the vector of x uh, components times a matrix, uh, sorry, which is equal to a matrix times x. In my case, the matrix here, its first or its top left component is going to be a11, and then across the row, it's going to be a11, a12, a1n, and so on and so forth, right? So the reason I use this sort of numbering system is so that you can easily identify these as um, elements of that matrix, okay? So in this case, my x here is a vector in Rn, right? It is equal to each one of these state variables that I'm focusing on. Okay, so the nice thing about linear systems, much like a linear programming problem, is that we can answer it explicitly. We know exactly what the solutions to this differential equation looks like. Now, this is contrary to a lot of the systems that we have already looked at and those that we will continue to look at. Because nonlinear systems, we don't have exact answers to. But it turns out that having a good understanding of linear systems can help us or provide us with an intuition about what's going on with nonlinear systems. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, we could say that if we have an eigenvalue and an eigenvector of the matrix A, so let's say AV is equal to lambda V, right? This is the usual eigenvalue, eigenvector relationship. V is a vector here, lambda is just a number. Well, this leads to a solution to my differential equation, which is the eigenvector v times e to the lambda t. That's it, right? That gives me a solution to my, my differential equation. You can easily check. If you differentiate this, you get lambda v e to the lambda t. And if you multiply a on the left side, the av becomes lambda v, giving you exactly the differential. So that's why I wrote it in this matrix notation so that you can easily see that this is a solution to this thing. Now, if you have all, uh, if you have all of the eigenvalues, you can use the fact that this is a linear system and you can put these things in superposition, right? So instead of doing a span of the eigenvectors, you would do a span of the eigenvectors with this time component as well on top of this thing. Now there is one thing that I want to mention to you, and you probably already know it, that eigenvalues don't have to just be real numbers. They could be complex numbers. And unfortunately, you know, we don't like 
uh, dealing with complex numbers, right? Especially if you think about maybe a, a, a modeling application, right? Maybe our whales population or our tree population or our yeast population, right? We do not want to have complex numbers. So what we would like to do is we would like to split these things up into their real and imaginary parts. So this means that you would write, say, uh, sorry, we would write lambda as, let's call it uh, a plus ib, okay? So we know that any complex number can be decomposed into its real, a, and its imaginary part, b. i here is the square root of minus 1. But you can do the same thing with the eigenvector, right? If the eigenvalue is complex, then so will be the eigenvector. So let's call this vr for real plus i times vi. All you're doing is separating out each component of your eigenvector into the real parts and the imaginary parts. Well, this actually gives you two solutions to your differential equation. Because in this case now you get x of t is equal to vr plus ivi. All I did was took the original eigenvector and wrote it as its real and imaginary parts. And then you get e to the at times cos of bt plus i sine of bt. Where does the cos and the sine come from? They come from Euler's formula. So you might remember this. Uh, let's just scribble it down. Euler's formula. It's how we deal with complex exponents in the exponential function. So you say e to the i times b is equal to cos of b plus i sine of b. All I had here was b times t instead. So if you want to put a t up here, make you feel better, there we go. But what you can see is that when you have imaginary parts, this leads to oscillations in your solutions. They're not just exponential anymore, right? They're not just growing or shrinking. Now, the way that you would separate this out is you would break it into the real and the imaginary parts, right? So if you've taken, uh, if you've done any work with complex numbers, you know that this is the main process that we have to do when we, do, when we work with uh, complex numbers, always separating out the real and the complex parts. So you would multiply this thing together and everything without an I in it, that becomes one solution to your differential equation. And everything with an I in front of it, well, you get rid of the I, and that gives you another solution to your differential equation. In fact, we can actually characterize every single solution to this differential equation uh, as, so all solutions look like, all solutions look like, well, they have a very standard form, okay? And the very standard form is that they are maybe some polynomial to some power multiplied by an exponential part and then a cosine part. We've seen the exponential and we've seen the cosine part. They just come from the real and the imaginary parts of your eigenvalues. I'll comment on the polynomial in a moment. But the other piece of this is with signs. Now, what this tells you, first of all, is that every solution to this differential equation is made up of terms that can be added and subtracted in multiples of each other that just look like this. This is how everything moves in time. They are just going to be potentially oscillating with exponential growth, maybe a little bit of polynomial uh, component at the bottom. But the main piece of this is the exponent, the exponential part, right? because exponentials grow or decay way faster than polynomials, no matter how big the polynomial power is. So this has the important property that if a is less than zero, this implies that our solution goes to zero as time goes to infinity, right? Because this thing, is, has a negative exponent and it pulls everybody down. Now if A is positive here, it's blowing everybody up. 
So essentially, really what it comes down to, even with these general forms, it comes down to whether or not the real part of your eigenvalue is positive or negative. Really, that's what everything is about here. Okay, so you might be wondering, where does that polynomial come from, the t to the power of k? Let me just do an example so that you can maybe see where this, where this comes from, and then we can talk through the general situation. Let's imagine you have x prime, or dx dt, is equal to x plus y. And let's imagine we have y prime is equal to just y. Okay, so in this case, if I separate this out into my proper matrix notation, this becomes 1, 1, 0, 1. Okay, so very, very simple matrix. In fact, it's an upper triangular matrix. You have zeros on the, the lower diagonal here. And what we know about that is that those are the eigenvalues. 1 and 1 are the eigenvalues of this thing. So this tells me that there's a solution that looks like e to the lambda t, which is lambda is just 1 e to the t. Okay? So the nice thing about this equation is we can actually solve it. I'm going to show you where these t's start popping up, okay? So I notice we have a double uh, eigenvalue here. Okay, so solving y prime equal to y, this part completely decouples. This gives you y is equal to uh, any constant c e to the t. Okay, so that is the general solution. This C is a constant of integration. It can be determined by initial conditions. Okay, but now I can put this into the other piece. So I get X prime is equal to X plus C E to the T, which I'm going to rearrange this. I get X prime minus X is equal to C E to the T. Now, in order to solve this, we need to use an integrating factor. I've done lecture series on integrating factors before, so I'll put a link in the description if you're not familiar with them. I'm going to sort of plow through because I want to solve this differential equation. I want you to see uh, you know, where these, these polynomial terms come from. Okay, So we're not going to worry too much about the process, uh, but I want you to look at the outcome. Okay, In this case, you get e to the minus t times x, all differentiated, is equal to a constant. And so I can integrate that up. I get e to the minus t times x is equal to a constant times t plus another constant we will call d. It comes from integrating this piece up. And so I get x is equal to c times t e to the t plus d e to the t. So what, what just happened? Well, we sort of grew one of those polynomial terms, one of these t to the k type things. So look at what happened. We had our y solution was just the piece corresponding to the eigenvalue, uh, the sort of solution, the general solution that I just gave you right here. But we can't double that up. That's sort of being represented at this piece. But because there's two eigenvalues at, at one, we don't want to, we can't just have two of exactly the same solutions. And so what you get is you get this multiplication by t in front. Now I derived it here for you for the but in general this is again what happens. So if you have an eigenvalue of your matrix A that is repeated four times, four times for example. Well, you're going to get one solution that has e to the eigenvalue times t. Then you're going to get t times e to the eigenvalue times t. Then you're going to get t squared times e to the eigenvalue times t. And then you're going to get t cubed times e to the eigenvalue uh, times t. This k can run from 0, which is the sort of general form that we have right here. And then k gets enumerated up to one less than the multiplicity of that eigenvalue. Again, if you have four of the same eigenvalue, k is going to run from 0 all the way up to 3. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. Double eigenvalue at 1. k is running from 0 up to 1 right here. 
That's what I want you to see, okay? But again, the polynomial term doesn't really matter. What really matters is the exponent. And in this case, because all of the eigenvalues are positive, that means that everybody is growing. The solution to this thing is growing in time. And therefore, you're going to get a sort of blow up as time goes on. Okay, in the next video, we're going to come back. We're going to do a fun little application of this so that you can see uh, how we can interpret these solutions and how, how we can actually arrive at them.